It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to have such a warm welcome. And I particularly also want to stress that I did indeed uh, spend, uh, well, nearly 20 years living in Wales and just across the water. Uh, and in my time there, I think particularly the thing I found most rewarding was working with uh, local groups such as the one here who are trying to bring their heritage not only uh, into a, a scholarly framework, but also particularly into one that connects with tourism, heritage tourism, development of education, all of these things in a connected up kind of way. And that's a journey I've been on on the other side of the Irish Sea uh, that's very connected here, of course. And uh, so the pleasure of these events, especially that interface with so many other dimensions of scholarship than just simply the academic ones, and uh, that's uh, what makes it really worthwhile. When saints lived and died, the things that were remembered about them were often, we might call a sort of suitcase of facts. So who, where they founded monasteries, the day of the year on which they died, what's known as the feast day, some of those things are facts that are probably fairly reliable. Often the year in which they die is harder to get right. Another problem with also saints is you have sometimes saints with very similar names, and also particularly a tendency in Ireland to augment the names with these suffixes and prefixes. So uh, St. Ed or St. Ed um, becomes Mo uh, Edog, uh, the Mo being an affectionate prefix my. Uh, the uh, og becoming a diminutive suffix, so essentially my little ed, I suppose, really, or something like that. But really it's a, a way of showing affiliation, so the saint becomes your saint, and the saint becomes a saint who is dear to you, so they get this sort of pet name as well. But this can lead to some saints with the same names or similar names being conflated together, and we do think that's probably the case with Saint Miog, who's conflated uh, with another saint. So we end up with a different obit. Uh, he may have died in 627 or in 659, um, but whether there are two saints or whether there's just some muddling of the facts, these are problems uh, that, oh, well, we could be here all day, but su sufficient for now. Uh, days been 14. Uh, this one, uh, possibly originally written in Irish. I've got my doubts about this theory, but another time. Um, but it's in a Latin form now. Uh, that one probably written about 1060, sometime in the mid 1000s. Now my first point simply here is to say, any historian confronted with the story of a saint who lived maybe in the 500s, but whose life, his earliest life comes from the 1000s, might reasonably ask the question, what are we actually doing here? I mean, is this text anything really to do with history? Well, that doesn't make it uninteresting as a text necessarily, but we have to have some skepticism about whether all the material we have in it is really immediate uh, to the saint. But there's another problem here as well, because people don't write about saints necessarily to convey historical facts. They're not necessarily writing not to convey historical facts, but the first point about a saint's life is it's meant to be edifying, okay? So it's meant to be something that is uplifting, inspiring, uh, and in a way, it's about particularly talking about the holiness of the saint. Now, a saint is a person you know, who was once usually a holy person. Some saints are fictional, but most are probably real. But attached to their reputation is both their status maybe as a religious leader, as many of our Celtic saints are, but also their performance of miraculous deeds. Okay? Their value as an intercessionary figure. Um, so the ability to do uh, supernatural things. And so often the writing of a saint's life is to verify those supernatural acts, okay, to document miracles. Also, as we see particularly with Irish and Welsh lives, we find also that these lives are written partly to document the privileges of the churches of those saints. So often their relationships, their entitlements, their land ownership, their roles liturgically in political life, these things are also what these lives are often about. And naturally enough, that isn't always what we would call historical information. But saints also have a materiality, and this is something I really want to stress, that one of the things we can resort to in understanding saints is the fact that saints are also artifacts of the landscape. And I think this is something very significant because where you have devotion, where you have the daily sensory experience of saints in rituals of devotion, uh, where you have investment in saints as destinations of pilgrimage, as 
objects of shrines, you have a landscape of saints' cults as well. And the materiality of saints is often more important than the literary reality. One of the problems in my field of work is that because we deal with texts a lot of the time, we write about texts as if texts were terribly powerful. But actually, most people didn't read, so texts are not that powerful. What's really powerful is where the saint is on the ground. Now, this is not an ancient site necessarily, though it may be an ancient site, but what you're looking at here, the materiality in this case is, uh, this is a holy well to St. David, and it's just down the road. Uh, it's between Enniscorthy and uh, Wexford. You turn off to the right, I forget the exact name of the village, but you can find it on the map. And there's a, actually, it's a massive site. It's got this great big, you know, great big sort of paddock with all sorts of stuff in it, really. It shows you that when this site was decorated back, I think, in the 1940s, that relationship between Ireland and Wales, between uh, the southeast of Ireland and the southwest of Wales, was front and centre of sort of the, the heritage industry at that time. But also, of course, holy wells are one of those materialities. And one thing everyone knows as an archaeologist is you can move a standing stone, you can even move a church. You can't move a holy well. It might move itself, but, you know, it stays where it is, you know. Well, they do get rededicated, but nothing's that settled in life, is it? But it's well to say people in this period did not think that all miracles were true. They often indeed felt that miracles needed to be verified. So we must remember that there's a difference between scepticism of an atheistic type we might have today and the ability to believe a miracle is true um, because some miracles they just believe weren't true. But they believe miracles per se were possible. The other thing to remember is, of course, is to try and take your mind in a way into the sensory experience of these people at the time. You know, when we're sick, we go down to the medical centre and we sit for you know, half an hour or so and we go to see a doctor. When such a uh, facility didn't exist, people believed in miracles. You know, they prayed to saints. They went and did a pattern around, you know, the landscape. They went and made devotional journeys to a shrine. Um, you know, their, their, their belief in the, the power of miracles was not intellectual, it was visceral. You know, that this was the difference between having no hope or some hope. So a lot of the time, the miracles are a very powerful thing, and people believe them because they want to believe them. Did they always believe them? You know, scepticism is a human characteristic. So we must never underestimate their ability to be critical. But, yeah, people believed in miracles, I'm sure, you know. And some people still do, you know. Uh, probably, but I think they didn't have a great critical framework once they'd admitted that a person had miracles, you know, and it's like to be a champion athlete, you must have won a race, you know, to be a saint, you must have had a miracle, you know, so it's sort of like it's kind of, kind of self, you know, self-supporting, but once you start adding the miracles on, well, people collect miracles and they say, I want to add this, this one I've heard as well, and they put them in. And often they make a comment saying, I've got more witnesses for this one than I've got for that one. But in the end, it became a sort of accumulative process. Um, but I don't know whether having more miracles necessarily made you, you know, a better saint. It might also be the quality of your miracles or the specific things, you know, associated. Memorable miracles are important. I mean, the memorability of something is important and what it might be a metaphor for or what it might enable people to see a saint as being, you know, and that, that I suppose, is also important. You see that in Trigavark. He's, he's finding things about David. Some of them he can't avoid, like David's intense holiness, he can't just simply ignore. He has to put it in and then say, but look, actually, it led him to being a really good bishop or something like that. They had to work with the facts that everybody remembered. And the, the fact that people remembered miracles meant you couldn't just write a book and pretend they weren't there, you know. So it sort of worked that way as well. Much of it is popular rather than just, you know, literature written in a vacuum, I guess.